Hello and welcome back to the Digital Marketing Podcast. My name is Kieran Rogers. I'm Louise Crossley. And I'm Daniel Rolls. And today we are discussing digital trends and we have some news updates. So let, let's start. We've got some tools, we've got some news, we've got some trends to go through. Something for everyone. There is. <laughs> and the, the first thing is we have got a new version of the Digital Marketing Toolkit. Yay. So that's our most popular download. Um, last, last episode of the podcast, yeah. we celebrated having launched our new brand. Listener, I must apologize, we were lying because we hadn't actually launched it at that point, but we knew the video would be coming out at the point. Yeah. That, yeah. That, so we had to record it in advance. This weekend... Uh, all hands on deck, launching the brand, redoing the toolkit, all the assets, the whole website, the presentations, everything. Everything. Yeah. So it Virtually quite... broke the internet. <laughs> it was a bit of a, it, it, we broke us. It was a bit of an intensive weekend. But anyway, it's all launched. We've updated the toolkit. Um, we've updated our learning platforms. If you haven't taken a look at that, take a look. But uh, if you Google digital marketing toolkit, it will be number one in Google, but it will be in the show notes as well. However, so you download that. But if, uh, if you well, haven't... Word of warning for everyone. Look at it properly before you start giving Daniel feedback. <laughs> what, what, what feedback? Me. Oh, I see. Was oh, this you? Yeah, I haven't really looked at it properly. It's really what, good. What is this, right? <laughs> I don't know. I just, yeah. Yeah, the, the brand's beautiful. It and to be beautiful. honest, you know, people mm. say, well, now we're going to do some user testing. Yeah. And, I, and I'm like, yeah, but I don't care because I love it. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what if it doesn't work? Don't care. I love it. It's so, too yeah. late. Yeah, it's too late now. But no, if you, if you do have any feedback on the brand, um, keep it to yourself unless it's positive. <laughs> no, but do let us know what you think as you go through. Um, we've updated the toolkit with loads of new tools. If you're not familiar with the Digital Marketing Toolkit, it's supposed to be a curated list of the best free tools that we all come across on a day by day. But Kieran has come across one that we're, isn't in there yet, but we're going to add in. So tell us about MILD. Yeah, MILD. So MILD is a search engine for emails from large brands. And I think it's brilliant. Like it, I, It's so good. Like if you just... Take a look at it, milge.com. Just go and have a look and type in you know, well-known brands that you that you know and love. And what it'll give you is all their recent emails. And it's so good for getting some inspiration. You know, I think very often with email, we get a bit stuck in a rut. And it's nice to, like, change things up and have it. Like, we're just experiencing that again. Like, the joy of looking at new and freshness with your own brand. It's a brilliant yeah, thing. Yeah, because we refreshed all our emails, yeah. same thing. And it was like, yeah. oh, this is a good opportunity yeah. to look at them. And we yeah. rewrote all our language yeah. and everything like that. So it's a good point. The other thing is it's not just brands. You can search by keyword. Yeah, right? it's keyword searchable. So, look, Louise, you found new ways of using it I hadn't even thought of. Well, I thought you'd be good for using it to find online shopping discounts. Yeah. We and it works. Like yeah. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so so no, definitely check it out. I yeah. Really Take a look. Mill.com, M I L L E D.com. Uh, and yeah, search for, search for emails, get some inspiration. Okay. So also breaking news uh, end of March, there was a Google Core update. And this is the bit that I meant is news that's not news. And I explain why I mean this. So a core update is a big update to the Google algorithm that Google tell us about. And the SEO world goes kind of bonkers about it. Mm. And the reality is, that no one really knows what the core update actually does. <laughs> they don't right? actually really tell anyone. No, they don't tell you. And then everyone comes out and gives you advice about what you should do. Um, the analogy from Google about what they're changing is, I think, quite disingenuous. And it says, well, imagine that you were searching for the top 10 movies a year ago. Now you're doing it again now. There'll be loads of new great movies out. And it's like, yeah, there will. But that's what the spiders do every day. That's not what a core update's about. A core update is about trying to improve the index. And this is where I get the opportunity to say, which I love to say, SEO is dead. <laughs> okay so i've been doing presentations on this for about 15 years now and um, my point is that everyone says well the things you should focus on are the user experience create great quality content that your users dwell on and engage with and like um, and then look at the technical aspects the technical audits and make sure that you are really kind of ticking the boxes there okay well that's what we've been doing forever and and the reality and, and you've said this, but you, know, you need to create great Just create great content. It's not right. rocket science. Yeah, That's this is kind it. of it. I, I, I've got into trouble for this before, where I came out, I think on Twitter years ago, and said, just create great content. It's not rocket science. <laughs> and, and everyone came back, oh, what does great content really mean? I mean, and it, I, I think, okay, just go through, consider your target audience, what's going to be useful to them. But the point being, at the moment, there's so much noise that actually, if you create average content, you might as well not be doing it. It's better to have less content. But better content. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Okay, and I think that's, I say this all the time, we've been saying this for years, and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, okay. And then they don't do it, they just carry on pumping what, content out. What, what I think is getting harder, and what, what is kind of true about that, the angle of whole SEO is dead. Like, gaming the algorithm hmm. 
is almost impossible because Google are using, and not just Google, all the search engines are using lots of user signals. Yeah. So you can't just create content that their bots are going to like because actually when people get mm. through to it and go, man, this is awful. Yeah. Um, and I, I look, actually, I still don't think they've quite got it right. There's still a lot of like obviously automatically written content yeah. that ranks really highly. In fact, there were some interesting experiments being done on Search Engine Journal. One of their writers had literally created a piece of content, obviously written by a machine. In fact, they even stated as, as such oh, okay. and able, was able to get that to rank in the, <laughs> the top page. But I think that's what's coming next. Like they're going to they're gonna really penalize. You know, when it like writes a paragraph about a thing and then it writes it again about the thing. and it, Like obviously, like when you, you read it as a user, that. you can recognize that. Mm. And that's why user signals are so useful because actually if Google can see you back it. back on their search engine looking for more of that, um, and of course they've got the Chrome user base, like 60% of the world's internet users use Chrome, like they know, like they're getting constant feedback from them. Well, just on that AI content point, I was looking at some data this morning and there was someone that said, look what's happened. And it was basically loads of people creating tons of AI content and seeing the traffic go up mm. And then seeing it plummet again afterwards. Now, my argument is that's not Google punishing them for that because in a lot of cases, Google can't detect it. Mm. But it's more if you create bad content, people get there and, go, Meh, and they leave, yeah. exactly as you say. Yeah. So by using user signals, it's self-selecting, which kind of means that you can use the AI tools if you do them, use them to make do a great job of writing. And they can really assist your writing, mm. but they can also pump out rubbish. But Google did say that they'd be trying to penalize people. They've said use. this, yeah, since last year, it's been in their... Um, their, their rules saying you're not allowed to use AI generated content, but you can't detect it's it. It's becoming anymore. harder and harder. You can in some cases. Yeah. There are certain writing patterns that a lot of the tools will follow, but if you use it to assist your writing, it's just you end up with writing mm. that's well written it, and it's that's the balance. It, it doesn't matter if it was written by a machine if it's an excellent article. An right, excellent exactly. article is still an excellent article and a poorly written, like overly like focusing on obvious keywords, but a bit random that you've gone onto that. Is clearly bad. That's and it. I, I think user signals would be the way that they that they get out of this. If they can yeah. fine tune that more, there'll be no stopping it. You know, it, over thousands of visits, you'll instantly be able to see which is the better piece of content, and that's what will what rank. What was also interesting is they came out recently and said uh, Google came out and said, "Look, links aren't going to be such a big signal for the same reason you're saying that you can you can try and fake that, whereas yeah. actually mm. a lot of the user signals you can't." Yeah. So interesting. The other piece of that was the technical audit. I still think that there is a validity to using a tool to doing that. Um, there are loads of tools out there and they do. We were discussing costs earlier on and we were kind of going on talking about we, we use SEM Rush. It's got quite expensive. It was like $120. And then I realized that I wanted the crawler that actually renders the JavaScript. Oh, that's an extra, I think another $50, 80 $100 a, yeah. a month. Forgive me. We'll put the actual prices into the show yeah. notes, SEM Rush. And, and uh, or not only that, it escalates very quickly if you want to give multiple team members access to yeah, it. Yeah, massively. But it is a brilliant tool, don't get me wrong. And mm -hmm. it doesn't just do SEO stuff. It does social media mm -hmm. stuff and all those kind of things. So it is probably one of the best tools. However, there are things like SE Ranking um, and See, so on that's a lot cheaper and does I, a lot of good stuff as I well. still use SE Ranking. Oh, me they, too. They have upped their game hugely. They've And they've got all, so they've got all sorts of bottoms as well. But what I love about their pricing structure is, you know, even the starting pricing structure, you're looking at about 35 dollars a month right. or so um you get multiple user licenses with that okay so, so that's instantly a big like huge difference and actually when i've tested it on certain keywords i've been exploring because i've had sem rush subscriptions as well their database is bigger it actually it draws from a, a larger amount okay. of data which i think is interesting in itself so if anyone from any seo tool wants yeah. to get in contact then then please do sem rush mm -hmm. se ranking or any of the others and we're happy to have a chat about things as well um while we're on search engines let's move on to another bit of news uh bing and we are going to do a separate episode on this. Bing. It's a nice word, right? I like saying it. Um, as of uh, January of this year, this is this is kind of a bit of a stat. Uh, online search engine being accounted for, according to this, eight point eight five percent of global search. Okay, now that's interesting because it was three percent a few years ago. According to this, it's eight point eight five. You've got a theory. Well, actually, playing around. Look, Bing's more than just Bing. Right, and this is the thing. When you get go to places like Statista, you get breakdowns of all different yep. search engines. But you have to understand Bing powers tons of stuff mm. that's not labeled up Bing. So Bing powers DuckDuckGo. It powers Ecosia. Ecosia is great. They plant yeah, trees yeah, for your searches. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, uh, it powers Quant. Which is the um, European. Which is European, yeah. very French. French and there's, there's, there's lots of them. Um, and okay, all sort of niche audiences, but actually they all have a real strong following. Like I work with a company who 
like they're looking for investors, so looking for high net worth individuals. And a lot of wealthy people don't want to share the data with you know every advertiser out there. And actually, they deliberately avoid platforms like Google, and they deliberately seek out things like DuckDuckGo and all sorts of privacy-focused things. So actually, in, in certain like audiences, so markets, like it, yeah. it, it can be can be a big big advantage. Um, and all you do, you just need to make sure that you're there on on Bing. So you know, go and get Bing Webmaster Tools set up. Like it's it's such an easy step, really. It'll take you half an hour to, to to do it. And what I love about all the Microsoft tools is they just let you suck everything in from from Google. Like if you've got Google Search Console set up, you can suck in your settings. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. But it it goes a lot further. Like they give you a ton more data. Like they don't hide data like do Google do. You don't get like key keyword volumes hi hidden unless. You, like, Sometimes, unless you're bidding on them in AdWords, you don't really know what. Yeah, so so is. Google Ads now, unless you're spending money, they That's don't fine. give you all the data. Yeah, do they? Yeah. And so, big, what does Bing Webmaster Tools give you? Oh, just a ton of stuff. It's got some. It's got some brilliant free SEO audit tools right. in there. So, if you don't want to pay for a suite, I have to like, admit, I haven't looked. Check it. Check it out. Really, really good. Like it'll it'll audit your site and give it. It's got some really great competitor analysis tools as well. It's got an amazing keyword research tool and that's that's what i love about it none of the data is hidden so when you get feedback from like the google ads api which is basically what everything uses to get the yeah. like, keyword volume very often you'll get keywords that you know don't have zero searches a month because you're getting a ton of traffic from mm. them but that tool says zero well that tool is a an adwords advertisers tool it's aimed to show what advertisers are interested in it was never intended for use for like SEO analysis. That's yes, a very good point. Yeah, whereas, so, whereas Bing Webmaster Tools gives you raw data. Now, here's the interesting thing, right? Google claim, I think it's eight, eight and a half billion searches on their search engine. Like Microsoft with Bing claim 900,000. That's over 10% of, of Google's Google's 900 search. million? 900 million. Yeah. yeah. That's 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 over 10% of 8.5 billion. Yeah, yeah like definitely. you say a lot of people will underestimate the power of that. And, and so uh, the, the num it's kind of number wang isn't it? It's like working this out, but taking those two figures it's like no, Microsoft Bing has got a significant place It's about table. 1 in 10 searches are yeah, done on Bing that's or lot. Bing platforms. That's a lot. But you don't have all the competition. Mm. And also, I don't think Bing as a search engine is obsessed with keeping you on a like Microsoft owned property. Mm. And that is one of Google's definitely caught like lots of research done into that, that actually a lot of users now, they never really click beyond Google search. Or if they do, they're looking at YouTube videos or looking at other, other Google related properties, which makes sense because they're an advertising network. But I just, yeah, I, I love to back the underdog. I can't believe that Microsoft are the underdog in this situation, but that's where Well, they is. won't be for long. Okay, so let's, let's they're going talk places. this through. Yeah, because of their investment in open AI, who, have developed ChatGPT and then building ChatGPT into the Bing search results. And when I say ChatGPT, you don't flinch anymore. No, I was looking at Kieran. Yeah, I saw you there. sniggering there. That's why I kind of asked yeah, as well. I'm, are you are you kind I'm, of coming round? I'm getting down with the kids. Okay, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> a little bit. Okay. On it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let, we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. But the fact they're building it into their search engine and they'll be the first people to do so, although obviously Google are launching Bard at some point as well. Mm -hmm just means loads of people are going to try it out. And you made a point to me as well. If you want to go on to the early list to get access to ChatGPT in Bing, it would boost you if you installed their browser. Yep. So if you installed Microsoft Edge, it's mm -hmm. one of the steps to, to get you to, to kind of get early access to it as well. And they're putting it down on like the taskbar and everything for the Surface laptops. Yeah, so exactly. literally everything you ask will be. Yeah. Now, popular. what's interesting with this though, is that they, they got themselves into a lot of trouble previously, Microsoft, for building their browser <coughs> into their operating system, i.e. you got a Microsoft product and you ended up with Internet Explorer and it cost them a lot of money. Um, and there's actually a lot of discussion about how it stopped them innovating in a way because they were really mm. scared of getting sued again. They're being a little bit more uh, aggressive in that as well. And I think no one else is offering the same thing. So they're able to do that as well. I think it's it's great. I mean, the more I play with it, the more mind boggled I get, but it's, it's interesting. So keep an eye on being, it needs to be part of your strategy. It is one in 10 searches. Mm. So yeah, if like it. me, you would sort of written edge off because you hated Internet Explorer because it was the bane of your life having yeah. to create technical workarounds on websites to yeah. make stuff work. Look again, like Edge, completely different beast. Mm. It's based on Chromium yeah. engine, isn't it? Yeah. It's super fast, yep. super good. And like, I actually have a bit of a problem with Google Chrome at the moment. And we were on, we were all on Macs, and um, I <laughs> had a few power issues lately. So Mac, this 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 Mac is a bit overly 
kind of souped up. It's got all, all the processes, all the memories, all the kind of crazy stuff in it. So it's it takes a huge amount of power. So your average power supply does not keep up with this it's Mac. It's like the monster truck. <laughs> it is Max, a bit of a monster truck. It's a bit of an embarrassment. Big but, tires. Yeah. And it it literally, I was running a training session and I was messaging Lou, like, Lou, Lou, bring in your power supply quickly. <laughs> and basically my power is dropping. And when these things get to 5%, they go haywire. Yeah. So they start your bit oh, starts start having a tantrum. Yeah, and it has a complete tantrum. Your audio starts cutting out. And I'm running a course, and everyone's looking at me going, What's wrong with it? What is going on here? So um on that basis, I was then looking at what is what is the biggest sucker power on this map? It's Chrome. Mm-hmm. So um just you know, power memory wise, all that kind of stuff, it's not great on Macs mm-hmm. a lot of the time. Check, check out Edge. Yeah, have a look. Yeah. And Safari, obviously, as well. And yeah. Firefox for those of you that are, you know, yeah, looking at privacy. Firefox. Yeah, we but use Edge is particularly good. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so, have you been are Microsoft sponsoring you all of a sudden? No, but I've just I've rediscovered a love for them. I'm I, actually in with the Microsoft team in two weeks, I, training some of their marketing oh, team on AI. So it's that's going to be really interesting. Love. I will do. I just said I'm going to yeah, show a picture of you and say yeah. he sends his love, and they will be like, terrified. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. Um, we're talking about AI. So AI tools. These are segueing nicely into each yeah. other today. It's as if we oh, plan this stuff. Huh? Um, AI tools. Right. You found a great website. Uh, there's an AI for that. Yeah, do you know what? I can't take credit for it. It's a right. brilliant, a brilliant web developer I work with called Matt Stacy. Yes, who I also love. I love you, Matt. <laughs> um, and he came up with this. Um, he he was desperate to meet some deadlines that I had for me, and then he starts sending me all this stuff on. I was like, oh, yeah, that's why you've not made a deadline. You've been playing with this stuff. AI it is, it yeah. is good. It's good. So this is a, it's an AI tool that finds and indexes other AI tools. It's kind of like a search engine for <laughs> yeah. AI. An AI talk- tool that's a search engine for AI. Yeah, tools. and we've talked about another one previously, didn't we? Yeah, it's Vincent, like a, that's one. Yeah, so so but this is this is a a great one because it, it's got a lot of stuff that I hadn't come across in there as well. So let's let's do this. So Kieran, you share one that you looked at. I so um Brightbid, I thought was quite interesting. So you're you haven't you're gonna play with this going forward, yeah, aren't you? So I haven't, explain okay. what it is. So I don't normally talk about tools I haven't played with, but this one looked very interesting. So mm-hmm. there are, it's an it's a pay-per-click tool but what they've created is a additional layer of of ai to help you manage your efficiency and the claims that they're making you can go along to the website and have a have a look and just search for brightbid um looks pretty impressive yeah i'd like to see some results behind that so i'm gonna take one of my smaller accounts and uh, also apply it to, to this and we'll see see how it yeah, all these will be in the show notes as normal, by the way. So targetinternet.com forward slash podcast on the new, beautifully redesigned, rebranded yeah. version of the page. Um, the one I absolutely love and I was playing with this morning was, as you go, it says it's sponsored yeah. by the ChatGPT website builder. So let's give a context. The new version of ChatGPT version four at the time where we are now, um, people, the day it came out, everyone's going crazy, going, oh, it can do these amazing things. It can You can literally do a sketch of a website and it will build that website for you. And I was like, awesome, right. I'm paying for my subscription. I'm going in there. And I was like, oh, what? what? I can't do it. So basically the chat interface that you get, you can't show it a picture, upload audio, anything like that. You have to do it via the API. Right. So unless you had access to the API and you're a dev, mm-hmm. it wasn't going to work. So and we've got access to the API now. But this particular website, um, it's at stunning.so, the S-O. And basically, it's a website builder. So you go in and say, what type of website do you want? You give it a, like a description. Yeah. It then asks you, what's your company name? What's your email? It will give you some design templates, and it will build out the website code for you. So they've just taken the API and done that as well. This is um, quite important in terms of innovation. Yeah. And I'll come to that in a moment. One other to mention I thought was interesting. <laughs> you came across one that did job applications for you. Oh, just so so good. I, mean, I haven't played around with that well, but it, it just made me laugh. You just think... My goodness, if I'm in HR, this would be terrifying. So like the premise is you've got AI that just applies for jobs for you. So it looks at the job description, yeah, the job yeah, outline, and the skills apply. that I wanted. Bosh, 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 bosh. Yeah. Um, suddenly, like 3,000 applications later. Well, this is already yeah. a problem in HR yeah, because what's happening is there's already AI yeah. tools being used to scan through job applications. So what's happening is that they get 3,000 applications, they chuck them into an AI, and it, it highlights the ones that it thinks are appropriate, which is actually wildly unfair in many cases because it's trained on certain things it's picking certain things up you can build bias into that really easily so for example if you say this is a really really success successful university yeah therefore people applying from that there we've got loads of people in our organization already that are from that university what you've just potentially built on is racial bias 
because essentially yeah. if you've got a very white school for example uh you haven't got diversity in that school you haven't done for a long time then you're suddenly there's a proxy for being you know having racism built into your algorithm it's, it's terrible and, and, but you can see this is going to be a war of attrition isn't it yeah uh, where you know, we've got bots applying for jobs we've got bots dealing with those applications yeah. It's like, wow. There's a lot of interesting stuff just in like society in general mm. at the moment around, look, is the genie out of the bottle on this AI? Because actually a lot of experts are saying that this is the next big, big revolution. Yes. This does change everything. And different like groups are dealing with it different ways. That The British government came out quite recently and said that we want a very low touch, light touch approach to this. What I thought was brilliant that we should link to this, the Times got chat GPT yeah, to write a prime minister's acceptance speech for the next British prime minister. And you read through this and this, this machine came up with a five point plan for the first hundred days in office. And I'm not being funny. I challenge anybody to read that and go, yeah, I'd vote for him or her. You, were you? Yeah, I'd, or like, it totally, or they. Or it or they, yeah. I would vote for those ideas because they're, they're, they're the solidly them. good. And then it, it gets really interesting because how's it got that? Well, it's got to those five points by looking at like millions of different discussions and data mm. on, on, on what's popular and what people actually care about. So message to the British government, like <laughs> you think this is light touch and it's not going to affect everybody. I'm sorry, but you need to think again because yeah, right. I'd vote for this machine over any of the current parties in, 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 in power. And it begs the question, do we actually need politicians? Because what do they do? They're supposed to like garner the public interest. Like, do you know what? They might just about become irrelevant. His, his volume went up quite seriously. <laughs> yeah. I'm, very, I'm very excited. Wow. That's that's like, from the mic. That yeah. was quite a rant. It's just Dear be Lord. ruled by machines. I, I, we kind of are already. Our engineer is over there on the other side going, oh, just the volume. And he's, <laughs> he's clapping his hands on his thighs. This is made recording an absolute this is nightmare. This thigh-slappingly good stuff. Okay, so I'm going I'm yeah. to take that and turn it into something useful less ranty <laughs> which is which is this uh, and it's a very valid point in there which is the approach to innovation yeah if governments and organizations don't realize they need to embrace this heavily not light touch mm. um to innovate they will get outmaneuvered so yeah. you could replace lots of different things yeah. and and the point being is that as an organization if i look at this for target internet and say right the digital marketing training learning space actually there will be loads of startups coming again well, we're just going to get ais to create courses we're going to get AIs to write articles. We're going to get AIs there, to do podcasts. There's, there's already an AI course builder. Yeah, exactly. So, so the reality is, you need to embrace this. You need to experiment with it. And like all innovation, it doesn't happen by accident. Mm. You have to build it in as a structured process. Um, and therefore, we need to really build this into looking at this, seeing what's possible, trying ideas out, applying them, test and learn, all that kind of stuff as well. So, it needs to be baked into to innovation in companies, in governments, in organizations of all types, I would suggest as well. Also, just one more thing whilst we're talking about AI, because me and Kieran were looking at the Bing um, AI emission rate, oh, yeah, right. and they've just lost their copyright. So, now you can use AI images, but you can't copyright them. Okay, that's interesting. So, um, very interesting because there's a load of stuff around copyright law around this as well that you could generate something and say that's now mine. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting if you can't do that. But also there's a thing about what if it generates a face that looks like yours and that's not your face, but I could copyright it because it's my image and I generated it and I can use it wherever I want. Mm. So there's all sorts of ethical things. So that we're starting to see the law catching up mm. a little bit and, they, and they, trying to go align. They mind do with it. do that with some of the music creation tools so that because they've had an issue with this, like someone will register a piece of music created by the AI as their copyright. And then if it, if that machine also turns out something similar, then there's a law lawsuit. It's actually what I've seen companies in that space do is they retain, look, we retain the full copyright over all of this, but you're free to use it. Yeah. And that, that's, well, that's the right way of doing okay, it. Okay, let's, yeah. let's give you where it's going next. So we watched a great video. Um, we, do you want to explain the video, the Kanye? Oh, so we were watching this video and it was basically a guy um, filming a podcast. And he was showing how you can obviously train AI to recognize and then mimic people's voices. Um, so he then recorded a rap of his own and then switched it into the voice of Kanye West. And he had Kanye West rapping this obviously thing, but it wasn't him. And you would not have known the difference. Really? It was terrifying. Yeah. And what he was saying was that the interface he was using to do it is the worst it's ever going to be at the moment. And actually, because <laughs> you have to code it, right? It so will only become harder and harder. Become, yeah, it will, it, will, it will become 
harder and harder to detect, yeah. easier and easier to do. Yeah. So the point is, you're just going, you're speaking to Mike, and in real time, it will be Kanye, or it will be, and hopefully not Kanye. We'll put the link we to it in like the show Kanye notes, anymore. though, because it was um, incredible. But yeah, it's it's pretty impressive. So See, uh, that's that's why I slap my thighs when I get animated about stuff, because AI can't copy that. Image. Well, I think it could probably could imitate it? the sound <laughs> as well, so we'll see. Maybe ha- maybe your thigh slap has a particular sound to it, Kieran, yeah, that's quite well, unique. Yeah. I don't know. But it's interesting, it. though, because then <laughs> even in the future of listening to music, you don't really know what's really been... No, and, and actually, if I go, create me a song in the style of x yeah. and it does it and it can do it in their voice anyway th- there's a lot of stuff to, to unpack for this but then it's also i guess ethically because you've done this before with overdub, overdub where you've trained your own voice yeah. but yeah so i he's mean he's not trained his own voice no so you know, if i use something like descript i can train it in my voice and i can record stuff but if you've got hours of anybody's voice you can train an ai with it yeah so suddenly deep faking voices deep faking video we get into a very tricky world where, where trust is it we talked about this before but where trust is increasingly going to be in demand and therefore building trust with our brands building brand is really important to stop the press i'm not actually even real there you go i was <laughs> replaced yeah. by ai years ago virtual thigh slapping <laughs> was going on um Right, let's uh, let's move on to the last one. Uh, non AI related, I promise. Uh, oh no, actually, it's probably it's some not, AI in this, really isn't it? Yeah, okay. So GA four, we are gradually coming to terms and falling in love a little bit with yeah. GA four. We have to admit. Yeah. Um, but let's just talk about custom audiences. So, Kieran, tell us about custom audiences. So, uh, look, it's just very powerful. You can you can link up your um, GA four with your AdWords yes. account, and what that I don't does. know this AdWords thing. I yeah. don't know when Google Ads. What, what year. Yeah. You're going to stop saying AdWords, and we're going to Everybody leave this in. Knows Never. what I'm talking about. Well, they do, but then we always get emails, and it's not called AdWords anymore. It sounded like this was recorded ten years ago. White. That's how we roll. <laughs> Don't oppress me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Microaggressions. Yeah, yeah. No. Right. So, so Google Ads. Then um, uh, they you can you can integrate it to you can integrate yeah. GA4 with Google Search Console as well, and you get a ton of extra data. So, like, it's well worth doing. Very simple to do. You just need admin access to the AdWords account and you can you can complete this step. But once you've done it, it means you can create audiences. And one of the things I found is you're explore like doing some of the explore reports. It's very easy to like right click on any segment or section that you've created in that report and just create an audience. Bosh done. Yeah. Like and actually w- w- with that, that's then available as an audience to draw upon with Yeah, AdWords. so it's worth explaining this. Yeah. So you, you create an audience. So for example, I witnessed those playing with it said um, people that have purchased. Yeah. So I could say purchases yeah. and I can use that as an audience then in Google Ads to yeah. target, but I can then generate lookalike audiences. Yes. So I can say, I want people that look like people that bought my product. It's, and it's it's, it's really, a nice way of doing really it. Really but it makes it a lot easier than ever before to do. Much easier yeah, to, to do. And what I, look, if you've got this set up well, you know, you'll have your um, privacy permissions. Like some people are opting into mm. this. And then your audiences are all like clean and clean and good. You're not going to have anybody in there that's not yeah. not that shouldn't be in there. Like it, it just makes life a lot easier when the data's all all joined up. And there's all sorts of possibilities you start to see. Like talk with your AdWords exec about this because you know you can look at like people that have added stuff to basket but not purchased. Okay, well, maybe a, a campaign for them. And it, and it doesn't just have to be a Google search campaign. It could be a you know a, a display campaign. And that could be really, really good. Like you could start creating offers, and yeah, you know, right. so going a bit beyond the oh, if you add stuff to basket and you don't purchase, then we send you an email. Everybody knows about that. It's kind of not, but actually, if if you entice people in with like some tasty offers, that could just really maximise on that ROI. And like display ads, they're cheap. Like yeah. you're paying on them cost per yeah, and per if thousand you, views. And the problem with display has always been it's been a bit broadcast. And actually, if you use audiences, it makes it a lot more targeted. really smart. So it really works really smart. well. Yeah, nice and joined up. So any other tools or trends we should be talking about, let us know. Uh, as ever, all of those will be in the show notes, targetinternet.com forward slash podcast. Also, whilst we're talking about GA4, the 18th of May is the next GA4 Masterclass. Ah, yeah, very good. So we had loads of people coming on these. So 18th of May, um, targetinternet.com forward slash GA4. And you can sign up for one of those half-day masterclasses online as well. As ever, thank you for listening to the Digital Marketing Podcast. We uh, are very glad to hear from you at any point. So drop us an email, drop us a message, and uh, we'll speak to you again soon. Please subscribe for more videos like this and visit targetinternet.com for more free digital marketing resources.